our next presenter, which is Dr. Genovese. Um, so Dr. Paula Genovese is a pediatrician dedicated to making the lives of children more comfortable. In addition to general pediatrics, Dr. Genovese specializes and is board certified in pain medicine, palliative medicine, and hospice care. She also studied and practices acupuncture. South American born with Italian roots, Dr. Genovese began her career as a pediatrician in an underdeveloped country. There she learned the importance of combining sharp clinical skills with the gentleness of human contact to maximize patient care. When she moved to the United States, Dr. Genovese trained at different hospitals throughout the country. These experiences provided different perspectives she believes helped her improve patient care. As a result, she is passionate about helping her patients make their day better and hopefully their future days brighter. With that said, Dr. Genovese, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. All right. Okay. I just for background, I did um, pediatrics at Sinai Hospital of, of Baltimore. I did pediatric pain management at Seattle Children's Hospice and Palliative Care at Ohio State University and acupuncture at Harvard. And as an extra interest, um, inter uh, integrative medicine is one of my main interests and in also learning different cultures. All right, let's start. Okay, so let's go for pain management. We all honesty, it's very difficult to find articles talking about pain management in any books or in any journals. The only thing that I found is you can use NSAIDs. So I try to ask more about my patients and some of you guys that are in the audience to try to gather more information of the different symptoms that you, you have. And I try to put it together. Let's see. Thank you. So what I learned is, is a mix between hypermobility, but it's not as severe as Ehlers Danlos syndrome and osteogenesis imperfect and but not as severe as that. So if you combine the two together, we have uh, the clinical features that uh, you sometimes um, present. So let's go, I usually go by system that is easier for me to, to understand. Headaches is something that is common. Migraine headaches, tension headaches, musculoskeletal headaches and cervicogenic headaches for vertebral compression, perhaps later in life. Um, what can we do with this? So for migraine headaches, usually a, a neurologist who see these headaches are just going over a little bit extra things that we can do as a baseline. Increase magnesium intake, you can use NSAID, I will say for migraine headaches, never wait to see, oh, my headache is gonna go away. Usually it doesn't, and it's very different than the other headaches. So when you feel it coming, take the medication early on because once the, the headache is severe, there's no medication that actually is gonna help. So be mindful that in this case, it's better earlier than wait to, if, to see if it goes away. Usually it doesn't go away. Um, acupuncture can also help with headaches as in general. If you go to a neurologist, they have more target medications that they can use. Um, there are several of them. You have um, Topamax, you have Amitriptyline. They have new medications they use specifically for certain antibodies and they can use Botox too. But just in general, that's things that you can do at home. Magnesium, high dose. And say it's take enough water, 90, 90 ounces a day at least, sleep well, don't skip me, uh, meals. Those, all those things are important. Tension headaches, those are very common headaches for everybody. It's, it's a matter of, I don't know why it's going on. Okay, let me be there. Tension headaches, just for daily life, we all have tension headaches. I will say, for this, it will be mostly what Dr. Sakarian mentioned in regards of relaxation. And they're usually added to other stressors in life. So if we can help with those, we can help with the tension headaches. 
musculoskeletal headaches, those are also very common. And in general, they tend to be on their own or sometimes they are along with other type of headaches like migraines. I don't think, I don't know anybody that has a chronic headache for any kind and doesn't have a muscle contraction because that is in the way that the body reacts. You have pain, your muscles contract because they're trying to protect the body. So what other things are, are the reason why you have musculoskeletal um, headaches? Posture, we all lately, we are over our computers most of the time, we don't exercise enough. Also the sleep position, um, you have no idea how many of my patients they have a one-sided headache or they cannot understand why the headache doesn't go away with the medication for migraines. And what is going on, just asking a good intake is they're sleeping in the wrong position. They don't realize that they are doing things at night that keep the keep their head on one side instead of being one with the rest of the body and that can overstretch the muscles, especially at night that we are kind of up dead weight the whole night. So you overstretch, you wake up with headache that can trigger your migraine headache also. Um, what, what else can you do? Massage, osteopathic manipulation. That is a work, it's not a chiropractor. This osteopathic manipulation works mostly in the muscles similar to craniosacral therapy and mostly for muscle relaxation. Those are easy things to do. And I cannot stress enough how important it is to have a good history. Take your time at the beginning with the patients. It, this cannot be an appointment of 15 minutes. We don't get anything from 15 minutes besides, hi, how are you? Our appointments in our clinic last two hours total. Usually with the psychologist, with the physician and the physical therapist is an hour, an hour and something. And that is barely enough to take all the information that we need and do a proper physical exam. The other type of uh, headaches that you, we can have later in life is cerv cervicogenic headaches. Those are the ones that are caused by the uh, bone that can be arthrosis, arthritis, or compression of the bones and the, at the exit of the nerves causing pain. Besides trying to relax that area, trying to open up more the spaces with osteopathic manipulation, we can do something called trigger point injection. That is injection of steroids in the muscles to try to relax them. You can do that also with musculoskeletal headaches. And for cervicogenic headaches, we have interventional pain. We can use different types of interventions. One can be an epidural intervention, if that is what is causing the problem. We can use also steroids in the, um, in the facets that or they are the little joints that are on the side of the neck where the, where the nerves go out. But they can do also radiofrequency ablation, that is, they stop those nerves that are mostly um, sensory nerves, so nothing happens with your movement, it's just you decrease the pain. That is in general for headaches. I, one more time, basics are super important. Water, sleep, don't skip meals. For the next one, talking about joints and hypermobility, dislocations, are something that can be seen. That means the, the joint come out of place. Subluxations come out of place and get them back in or sprains that are very common too. Don't, um, I think orthopedics talk about a little bit about this and I can talk a little bit more. And for the mechanical misalignments that we have, many patients that I saw with um, hypophosphatemia, they have fest planus that is flat feet because the feet are full of tiny bones. Those bones are connected by several ligaments. If you have those ligaments that are more flexible at the beginning of your life, they tend to collapse the arch. Then you have flat feet. Having a flat feet that change the mechanics of your whole feet, and the, then it's gonna change the mechanics of your ankles. They're gonna go in a little bit. And then the distribution of the weight and the knee is different, causing pain also. And then to the hips, and it's called a chain reaction to the lower back and then upper back. So those little things that we can change with 
maybe an insert is easily fixable and will decrease further problems. Okay, so I talk about all that, so I cannot stress enough how important it is to have an early PT and OT evaluation, especially to see these problems. Like I said, there is not a matter of medication. When is the, the best time to, to take care of this? Early on. So we don't have to progress to arthritis, arthrosis, or orthopedic surgeries. Um, knowing that we tend to have more mobility in some of the joints, we have in uh, at PCH a good protocol that physical therapy uses for hypermobility, and that is the name of the book, Live Life uh, to the Fullest with Erlos Danlos Syndrome. They go, they focus more on Erlos Danlos, but I think you can take the basics. And if you if you come to the clinic, I probably will refer you to physical therapy to follow that protocol. Can you do it outside of PCH? Yes, you can. You can buy the book and you can show it to somebody who does physical therapy. But um, our group has an expertise treating patients day in and day out. And I can tell you for all the patients that I see, there is a difference for them. It takes a long time, but it, there is a difference. In the way that they do it is they work um, kind of a building blocks. They start for the core of the body and then they keep adding the other areas of the body. And it's not a matter of we're gonna do something this week and the next week the following. They tend to focus on one area. And when you master that area, it can take you a week, can take you a month, can take you two months. Then they go to the next one. Because like I said, if, you, if your foundation is not well done, then the whole building is gonna fall. So this is a slow, a steady with permanent results. The other thing that we can do easily, having shoe inserts, try to change the posture uh, and, to, and ask also, what are you doing? What are you doing frequently? We ask in our intake, uh, do you have any hobbies? Do you have any instruments that, you, that we play? Or do you play any sports? Just to give you an example, the other day, not related to um, hypophosphatemia, but it was a patient that I have, they have several complaints of different reasons and ended up having back pain with um, numbness and tingling and we couldn't ex explain from where it was coming. They did all the MRI studies that you can imagine, nothing there. What happened is that he played archery all the time and he contract all the muscles in the back and that causes the pain. But if we don't ask, we don't know. The other thing that we I, I will suggest to all our patients is to do a um, exercise with low impact, like swimming. It was in the other slide, sorry, it's, I don't know for what reason it moved faster. Swimming is something that is going to increase your endurance, that is going to, it's not going to put pressure on your joints or your, and it's going to increase in general. Um, your baseline activity. I will highly recommend um, swimming. The other areas that can be affected for joint and bones that has impaired bone mineralization, we can have fractures and all these or the orthopedic surgeons talk about this. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the pain management before they go for surgery or before they get to the point to go for surgery. Fractures, airline fractures, stress fractures, compression fractures, or the deposition of the calcium in the pyrophosphate in the joint, we can have some uh, an acute symptom like pseudogout, root, and a chronic symptom like chondrocalcinosis that is similar to arthritis. And another one that I don't think it was mentioned, I found in one, one or two studies saying that chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis is something that is not very common, but it's a little higher in incidence with um, hypophosphatemia. And um, the reason why they found this, and I, I found it interesting, it says that, and this study says that enzyme, the ALP, the tissue non-specific ALP, 
has a some degree of anti-inflammatory mesenchymal cells. The mesenchyma are the cells that form bones and cartilage. So if you don't have the anti-inflammatory effect of that, what is happening is you're going to have more inflammation, and that inflammation can create uh, this specific um, symptom or pathology. All right, next one. What can you do? We are going to start usually with NSAIDs, like every article said, but I'm going to say this. For acute pseudo gout, that is a very painful process. I personally will use NSAIDs first for the anti inflammatory property. I might use other um, neuropathic medications for a short time just to try to um, use different type of uh, medications at the same time working in different receptors to try to control the pain as much as possible. And this is in one of the rare cases that I will use opioids for a very short time, knowing how painful if this can be. I tend to don't use opioids um, in general, but in this case, I will use at least for one or two days. For the chronic uh, cerebral arthritis, we can use NSAIDs like before, for sure. We can use other long-term non-opioid meds like gabapentin, clonidine, clonidine, and I have a, a full slide of the other medications that we can use. But in general, I try to stay away from opioids unless absolutely necessary. And you say, how much time is the time to use a medication? As short as possible. That that always going to be my answer. What I tend to do is to um, start a medication, reassess in probably four to six months, try to decrease and see if that is the pain is the same or is increasing. And I keep doing that because I don't want to keep anybody on medication if they don't need to be on one. So other things that we can do, uh, coming from interventional pain, we can do in the joints, we can do nerve blocks, we can do ortho, can do intraticular steroids if they want to, that is not my area. But for nerve blocks, there are several nerve blocks that it can be done, targeting sensation in the area, but no mobility. And depends on what joint we're talking about. And I will say, in general, low impact exercises, are your friends to try to keep the mineralization of the of the bone. Walk steps gently. If it's difficult to take up a full step, maybe one or two inches above the ground with something holding on the side, like a walker or something, so you feel safe. That is another way to do it. Mm -hmm. Neuropathy is another thing that I saw on my patients and is repeating, repeating in some patients. It can be for nerve compression, like a spine compression fractures that orthopedics mentioned before. The treatment is the same that you will use for the one for the headaches that are cervicogenic. For us and only my area, orthopedics are a different way and neurosurgery have a different way to do it but just to try to decrease the pain in the meantime, they proceed with another type of intervention. I will say um, thin nerve blocks or epidural um, injections. Small fiber neuropathy is also something that I found in some of my patients. Medications is what you use for that. Skin hypersensitivity, sometimes due for the small fiber neuropathy, sometimes is something that is just present in the patients. Um, we tend to do desensitization. Occupational therapy usually does the desensitization with different textures. The idea is to try to retrain your skin to, to don't feel the, the pain that you feel with, with the touch. And it takes some time. So I will say one more time, occupational therapy is important on this area. And one thing that I, I think is important to know is that the neuropathy, sometimes when we hear a, pain, a patient has numbness or tingling, we go directly to, oh my God, this is a small fiber neuropathy, this is this and that. When sometimes what happens is you have an, because you have more hypermobility, you can have an intermittent compression of the nerves. 
you can have that on the feet that can mimic a peripheral neuropathy. What happened if we have different areas where, where you can, when putting pressure on the joint standing up, you can collapse the space for where the nerves go through and it can cause numbness and tingling initially. And it kind of go numb and can go away after a little while, but that is usually what happens or when you are active, you are standing on your feet or, call, or walking for a long time, that can also happen. Um, can happen there th sometimes in the way that you sit, you can be compressing in the knee, in the external part of the peroneal nerve, you can have some some numbness and tingling on the side of the leg and on the foot after that. If you are compressing the internal part of the ankle, you can have um, numbness and tingling on the foot. That can be very much confused with peripheral neuropathy if we don't ask questions or if we don't um, assess the patient fully. When we assess them in the clinic, we usually ask them to bring shorts or Anything that you can bring, you can see up to the knee, from the toes to the knee. No foot, and we ask them to take off their their shoes and socks, and we and we walk them in the hallway to assess motility and um, mechanical misalignment. Okay, I think I mentioned all this already. So myopathy, this is something that I, I saw that somebody was asking in a previous presentation. From what I read, they don't know exactly from where it's coming. It's a decrease in the muscular tone, plus minus weakness, tiredness, um, you feel fatigue. The only, I've only found one study, and this is an one only study or a article and I, I don't know if they have any backup from that. It says in this study that the enzyme, the ALP, is, um, is present in the skeletal muscle in one area that is the unit of the skeletal muscle called sarcoplasms, and in a specific area called, called D-line. So when you don't have the hypothesis is that if you don't have this enzyme, perhaps this is causing denervation or uh, regeneration of the non innervator mu muscle fibers. This is just a theory. I can tell you what we see in clinic. Tiredness, um, fatigue, decrease of endurance, um, lack of tolerance, and it's very, it feels very similar to fibromyalgia, and we treat it in the same way. Um, it's not changing. Um, swimming for endurance, try to don't put pressure on the joints, low impact exercise for bone health, and I cannot stress enough, small gradual increments in physical activity. This is the pacing activity that Dr. Sakarian mentioned before. We do that in all our chronic patients because what happens is that the less that you do, the more tired you are. And funny enough, you need to start doing things to feel less tired. And it's very difficult to break that cycle because when you feel better, for every reason, you have a good day, you want to do things, you do a lot more than you should probably, and then the next day you are done, done for several days with more pain, difficult to move, then you, if you keep doing that cycle, at some point it's a matter of, why bother to do things if I know I'm going to hurt more? So this is where the pacing of the activity is important. And when we say pacing, we said walk for a minute. It's literally a minute. And keep it like that. Then probably next week, two minutes. And it's just that. But makes a huge difference in the long run. Because you're slowly, you are changing how you not only how you feel in your body, but in your mind, knowing that you can do more than you were doing maybe two or three weeks ago. And if you see it back in, in, six, in six months, perhaps a lot more. But if the idea is to start slow and keep building on that. 
So, medications. Like I said before, the less possible uh, time and dose of medications, at least for how I practice. Tylenol, you can use NSAIDs. Sure, you can use it for how long? Less possible. Uh, be careful. If you have any gastritis or any other issues, we can change to Celebrex. That is the uh, one that has less GI, um, less GI issues. Gabapentin, pregabalin. I personally like them because they're more clean drugs. Um, they don't have medication interactions like others. They don't have active metabolites. Um, they, the only thing that you can have to be careful is if you have renal insufficiency, you need to adjust the dose. And as a side effect, fatigue sometimes happens, especially at the beginning. And like any other neuropathic medications, they can cause a mood change. Sometimes our patients are more irritable. Sometimes they're more depressed. If that is the case, we stop the medication, we change for something different. Um, insurance usually pays for gabapentin, and if you fail that one, pay for Lyrica. Otherwise, they don't pay for Lyrica straight out. TCA, um, tricyclic um, is also an old medication. Amitriptyline or triptyline are the more frequent medications. Um, it has been used. The thing is that it can be good and bad. They have very, they have different receptors that they act in a low level that sometimes can be helpful, like helps you to sleep. You take it at night, helps you to sleep because it has some antihistaminic properties, but they can also cause some side effects like postural hypotension. You feel more dizzy in the morning. Um, they can cause constipation also. And you need an EKG before starting the medication because they can cause uh, prolongation in the QT, and that can give you arrhythmias. It's super rare, but we need to we need to do a, a proper um, assessment first. SNRIs, these are serotonin norepinephrine receptor in, um, reuptake in, in inhibitors. We use these for psychiatry. We use for anxiety, depression, and we use them for pain. So it can be two for one. Clonidine is an alpha-2 agonist, central alpha-2 agonist. We use this medication as an opioid adjuvant and we use, or alone, and we can use opioid sparing, and we can use also to, for sleep at night. And if you, are, you have somebody that is anxious, I will choose this medication first because being an alpha agonist, it works in the, in the fight or flight response also, at least for what we see. And we try to dump that. Perhaps you're going to have, if you are anxious, we try to dump that and it's going to, you're going to have a better sleep. Other medications that sometimes I use just to consider low dose naltrexone. Naltrexone is an antagonist of the opioids receptor. And when you use at a lower dose, can create an increase in the endogenous opioids that you have in our body, in, in our body, very low dose. And personally, one one medication that I would like to try more is buprenorphine. It's a partial agonist of the opioids. Initially, it was used for um, for addiction to try to decrease. The, um, the craving for the opioids, but if we use a low, very low dose, it's a good medication for acute pain. And the advantage is that doesn't have, um, it has a ceiling effect for respiratory depression, meaning if you give even a super high dose, you're not gonna have any issues with decreased respiratory rate. And I think it's important because this can be a problem with a full agonist. And late, the last one that I mentioned is opioids. Any kind of opioids that are full agonists, I personally try to don't use, like I mentioned before, for several reasons. And also, they, if you use chronically, they can decrease the bone density. And I don't think it's a good thing for you guys. In general, I try to use the less possible medication. And I try to look for other mechanical changes or behavior changes that we can, in the way that we can help you. So as an extra, and this is just a suggestion, 
every patient that I talk with, they have pain in the site of injection. And if the enzyme replacement therapy is something that you guys need. So I was thinking there is one system that we always forget that is the lymphatic system. The lymphatics are the one that take care of moving the inflammatory um, um, substances and molecules that are there out of there to try to decrease in a way the inflammation too. And in, like I said, it's just an idea, but it doesn't hurt to try. If you have, if you do a very gentle lymphatic drainage with your own hands in the area where you, where you have the injection site, perhaps that can decrease the um, the pain that is there because it's a very localized pain. You can have pain at the injection, weakness, and heaviness. That that can be a symptom of a lymphatic overuse or blockage, and or at least an increase in the in the work of the lymphatic in the area. If we can help that with a very gentle massage, like I said, you can do it. Perhaps that can help. I'm just saying, try it. I don't have any scientific evidence, but I thought it could help. And the last one is try to be preventive rather than the reactive approach with an early PT and OT evaluation, look for mechanical uh, changes, look for lifestyle, lifestyle changes, swimming, less medications, more uh, changes in, in your life, low impact exercise and activities, activity pacing. And a little bit of medications when needed, only when needed. And I think that's it for me. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm available.